بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته So we always make this statement from one thing we learn 10,000 things from one thing we learn myriad things abundant things countless things from one principle from one incident from one piece of life experience you should be able to apply understand grasp break down a thousand other things in life from one thing you can know you can learn you can understand you can properly handle yourself in a thousand different situations now people may look at this statement as being exaggerated or a little idealistic or mystical or romantic whatever the case may be but if you sit down and think about it one thing that you learned when you were younger one lesson you got from your father from your mother your grandmother a teacher a bully a coach anybody that you came across in life you were young they taught you something whether it was an easy lesson a free lesson or whether it was a hard earned lesson you learned the lesson the hard way and now you're 20 30 40 50 older than that and you keep applying that one principle that one piece of life experience I'll never make the same mistake again this time this happened to me, I got jammed up here, etc. I'm better, I'm wise, I'm smarter. I learned from that, I'm beyond that. So if you really sit down and think about it, it's not an exaggerated statement. You can apply one accident, one car accident, one bad experience, one marriage, one divorce, one type of incarceration, one bad business deal, one failed exam, whatever it is. One game that you lost, one video game that you, you know, you misplaced, you dropped your phone, being careless, whatever the case may be. And you can apply that to a thousand, ten thousand other situations in life, experience. Now, this principle or this way of thinking is not foreign to Islam. It's not strange to Islam. It isn't alien to Islam. Rather, this is one of the most important Islamic principles. And that is to take one piece and understand 50 or 100 pieces. To take one incident, one thing that happened, and to apply it universally, perpetually. The Quran al-Kareem is full of this. The Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu is full of this principle, understanding this principle. It's to take a thing and to compare it to another thing and reach the same ruling and reach the same conclusion. When you read Juz Amma, one of the biggest and most important themes of Juz Amma are the previous nations. Ad, Thamud, Musa, Firaun, right? Allah talks about the previous nations, how strong they were, how powerful they were. And then Allah, He mentions that He destroyed them, He wiped them away, He did away with them, He vanquished them because of what? They all shared the same bloodline, they all shared the same lineage. No, it's because they all made the same mistake. And that was disobedience to the messengers. They rejected the messengers, they made fun of the messengers. They belied the messengers. Nuh is building a ship in the middle of the desert. Moses, who was raised in the house of Pharaoh, who, could, who was stuttering, he couldn't speak clearly. And now you're telling me, and the top of that, just yesterday you killed the man. You just made murder. We can barely understand your speech. You were raised in our house. We fed you, we raised you, we protected you. We, gave, we made you an exception to the rest of the uh, Banu Israel being killed and murdered. And now tomorrow, the next day, you're a messenger from God. One God. And you're telling me that I have to submit and listen to you and obey you and follow you and release Banu Israel. We may read the story simply, easily, but that's a big deal. If you just think about it, that's a real big deal. So everything that happened to those prophets and messengers, the common denominator was one. The ingredient was the same, and that was a takdeeb wal isyan. Denial and rejection of the messengers and disobedience to the messengers. So Allah is teaching us and telling us is that if and when, whenever a people do a thing that the previous nations did, their fate will be the same. So we learn from one nation, 
We learn from one era, from one race, from one kingdom, from one dynasty, what will happen to any other kingdom or race or dynasty or world power if they do the same thing. And obviously that in itself is a, a lecture, lectures. As far as the hadith of the Prophet then there are many, many authentic hadiths. From them is the authentic hadith, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrated, and the hadith is in the Sahih, is that a man, he went to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and he said, Inni mra'ati waladat li ghulaman aswada. He says, my wife gave birth to a black boy, a black child. And the man who went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he was not black. His ethnicity, his skin color, whatever the case may be. In other words, my wife, she cheated on something. She cheated on me. My wife slept with a man of African ancestry. Or a man of African ancestry violated my wife. What's important is it's not my son. This child with this skin complexion is not mine's. So the Messenger of Allah والسلام, with his gentleness, his, his tolerance, his hikmah, his clemency, he asked the man, he said, Hal He says, do you have camels? Are you an owner of camels? The man applied, or he replied in the affirmative, yes. He says, Ma lonuha? What color are your camels? And the man, he told the Prophet والسلام, they're, they're like red, brown, orange, orange, auburn type of color. And the Messenger of Allah والسلام, he says, Hal fiha min awraq? Is there any camel among those camels? Which, uh, and before the Prophet asked him this, the part of the hadith he says, He said, your son has dark skin because of one of your ancestors having dark skin. And the genetics, the genes, you may not have the same skin complexion, but one of your forefathers or foremothers have very dark skin. So the man, he couldn't accept that. And the Prophet he asked him, do you have camels? What color are your camels? The man told him what color the camels were. The Prophet ﷺ said, Hal fiha min Or do you have any grayish or lighter color camels? And the man said, yes. The Prophet ﷺ says, how is that? The rest of them are red. The rest of them are orange. The rest of them are brown. How do you have one that's grayish? How? That's impossible. And the man said, La'allahu naz'ahu irq. He says, one of the ancestors of this camel had a similar shade or color. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, that's what happened to your son. لَعَلَّهُ نَزْعَهُ إِرْقُنْ Your wife didn't cheat on you. No one raped your wife. No one violated your wife. Whether you want to accept it or not, one of your forefathers looked like that. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in this authentic hadith, he taught the man how to think. Just like this is applying, then you also apply it in other places. This is logical, right? This makes sense. This is feasible, right? This is tangible, it's plausible here. It isn't something which is impossible. So the same thing happened to your son and it isn't what? Impossible. So he gave him the principle and he allowed him to apply that principle to what? A thousand other situations. Also, the famous narration of Abu Musa radiallahu anhu and Abdullah bin Mas'ud. They had a debate and they had a discussion. They differed on Ara'ita لو أن رجلا أجنب بالليل ولم يجد الماء and the hadith is also in the Sahihain he asked oh Abu Abd Rahman he asked him he says what if a man is traveling at night and a man has sexual intercourse or he has a wet dream what's important is he becomes junub he's in a state of ritual impurity major ritual impurity and there's no water to wash up he can't make a ghusl what should the man do and he went back and forth make the salah without wudu etc 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 so Abu Musa radiallahu anhu, he went on to tell him what happened to him one night. I was traveling one night, and the same thing happened to me. I became junub, and there was no water, or the water was too far, or the water was, it was too cold. I couldn't use the water, one reason or another. And I told the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, what I did. He said, Abu Musa said, فَتَمَرَّقْتُ كَمَا تَمَرَّقُ الدَّابَتُ He said, so I took off my clothes, I lie down on the ground and I rolled around in the dirt in the sand like an animal would do. An animal in the desert, a desert fox, a desert lizard, like an animal would roll around in the, in, in the dirt trying to stay cool, trying to avoid the heat of the desert, whatever the case may be. So the Messenger of Allah والسلام, he said to Abu Musa, he said, He says, the only thing that you had to do 
was to wipe over your face and your hands with the dirt. That was it. In other words, the only thing that was mandatory or upon you was to make tayammum. You didn't have to make a ghusl with dirt. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not repudiate Abu Musa from doing, from doing what? Applying the principle of the water to the, to the dirt. He never said you were wrong, or that's incorrect, or you earned a sin. He says the only thing that you had to do was this and that. So Abu Musa radiallahu he applied what? The principle of, from one thing, and this is known as al-qiyas. Al-qiyas. A systematic analogy. The Messenger of Allah says, in the third authentic hadith, hadith collected in the Sahih, the Prophet ﷺ, he told the companions what to do, how to gain good rewards, good deeds, get closer to Allah, and that there is no superiority for the rich over the poor unless they're equal, unless they're superior in taqwa. And he said, when you make tasbih, when you make takbir, when you make tahleel, that's sadaqah. And joining the good, forbidding the evil, is sadaqah. All of those things are sadaqah. He says, وَفِي بُطْعِ أَحْدِكُمْ sadaqah." And when a man goes to his wife, not to feed her, not to clothe her, not to teach her, not to discipline her, not to remind her about Allah, but when he goes to his wife to fulfill his carnal desires, his lusts, he wants to have sex with his wife. وَفِي بُطْعِ أَحْدِكُمْ sadaqah." He says, that is a type of charity. The companions, what do you mean? How does a man get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by fulfilling his lustful desires with his wife? He said, Araitum Lo what I have fi haramin Akan alayhi wizrun. What if he fulfilled his desires, his carnal desires, if that man fulfilled his lusts in an unlawful manner, in an infidelist manner, if he slept with a woman that wasn't his wife, wasn't from his right hand possessions, it's haram for him to have sexual contact with any other woman besides those two. Would he get a sin? The companions, they said, of course he would. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ said, وَكَذَلِكَ إِذَا وَضَعَهَا فِي الْحَلَالِ He says, and if he places it in the halal way, he'll get a what? A reward. So he gets a sin here, so why shouldn't he get a reward? Here. Just like this is established, then you use the same principle and what? Apply it to another situation. Everyone understand this? So the concept of qiyas, the concept of making an analogy, taking something, comparing it to something else. Or, even if it isn't qiyas, but just the concept of understanding and starting off with one small thing and turning it into something big and large, like a business. Whether that business is legitimate, what? Or illegitimate. You start off with what? Something small and simple and the next thing you know, Huh? Don't act like we don't know, guys. Inshallah, if you're wise and if you're smart, you build an empire. From what? We don't quote what the poet said. Uh, you can build an empire from just one what? Well, heck it there. So the concept of understanding and branching off. Branching off. I got it. Now let me apply it to other situations. Let me expand my knowledge. Let me get a, gra a greater, deeper understanding of how things work. And that's what I want to share with you tonight, Bidna Ta'ala, with regards to the surah that we all know, we all recite in our salah. The surah that the Prophet ﷺ said so much about, and that is Surah Al-Fatiha. There are hadiths of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, authentic hadiths, that talk about the virtue and the excellence of Fatiha. It's an excellent thing, a beautiful thing, an awesome surah. And there's nothing like any of the previous, uh, nothing in the previous scriptures like Surah Al-Fatiha. The Injil, the Torah, Allah never sent down a chapter in any previous book superior to the Fatiha. So he said that about the Fatiha, many different narrations from them is the narration which the Sahaba were traveling and all of a sudden they wanted to stop or they wanted to rest. And it was the common custom that whenever someone was traveling, the locals would host him and entertain them. Give them drink, give them water, feed their camels, their horses, allow them to rest. Traveling back then was very, very exhausting. And of course, even to this day, traveling is extremely exhausting. 
Just because we have airplanes and jets and, and trains, it doesn't mean that traveling is sweet and easy. The Prophet ﷺ says, Inna safaraqat atum min al adab. When you travel, it's a piece of torment, a piece of punishment. فَإِذَا قَضَى أَحَدُكُمْ نَهْمَتَهُ He says, is that يَمْنَعُوا أَحَدُكُمْ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ وَنَوْمَهُ You can't eat properly, you can't drink properly, you can't sleep properly. So whenever you're done, whenever you finish your business, فَلْيُعَجِّلْ Go back to your family immediately. When you travel, your sleep is off. Your drinking and eating is off. When you're done your business, what? Go home. Because traveling is tiresome. It beats you down. And even in our modern times, there lies no doubt. Traveling is, it, you can feel the effects of it. The jet lag. Even if it's not a long flight. You're so high up in the air. You're traveling so fast. It's an hour, two hour, three hour difference. When you land, you feel it. Let alone the fact that you had to get to the airport early. You couldn't sleep. You can't sleep sitting up the same way you can sleep lying down. The airplane is small, it's tiny, your knees are cramped. The person in front of you puts their chair all the way back. Ever happened to you, right? You just start getting comfortable and they start to... Right? And you feel even tighter on the airplane. Or you have the aisle seat and somebody has to keep getting up to use the bathroom. Or you're in the window seat and you have to what? Wake somebody up to use the bathroom. Or it's a baby crying on the airplane. Ever happened to you? Well, I have that. The baby won't stop crying. Or it's an unruly child going crazy, seven, eight hour flight. Or, like what happened to me the other day, is a cat on a plane. And a cat kept meowing, meow, 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 nonstop. So you're tired, you're jet lagged, you're trying to sleep, or you're trying to read, or whatever you're trying to do, and the cat just keeps, you get the point I'm trying to make. It's no matter what type of comfort you have, traveling will always be challenging. At best, let alone an actual adab, qita min al adab. And I think anyone who's traveled can attest to that, no matter how comfortable it is. So the Sahaba were traveling, the Arab custom, the way of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, where as Allah mentioned that they entered his home and they didn't ask for permission. Ibrahim's house was always open for the guests. So they were traveling, they wanted to rest, and for one reason or another, the tribe, they refused. No, we won't host you. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they said no problem, and they left, they walked off. And Allah had decreed that night, that evening, for the leader of that clan, the sheikh of that tribe, Walida, oh, 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 he says, Ludiga, Sayyidul Qabila. He was, uh, he, he was bitten. He was stung by some type of venomous creature. A centipede, a scorpion, a camel spider, right? You ever seen an him before? I've seen a camel spider before in Medina. It's not something that you want to see and run into. Wallahi. It's a reality. And he called it a camel spider because the thing is huge. It's a huge spider. And the saliva of the spider, if it bites you, it literally will rot away your flesh. Just Google camel spider. Camel spider wound, if you think I'm just making this up. huh? What's important is, is that the leader of the tribe, he was stung. So they did everything that they possibly could. Give him this, try to get the poison out, try to suck the poison out. Everything, nothing worked. So obviously they were in a great deal of distress. And one of them said, maybe those travelers, maybe they know something. Maybe they have some special medicine. Who knows? Let us suck up our pride. We rejected them. Let us go ask them and beg them to help us out. So he went to the Sahaba and he said that our leader has been stung. And perhaps he says, Hal fikum min raqin? One of you guys do ruqya? One of you guys can recite on him and inshallah remove the, the pain that he's going through, his, his sweat, his fever, his shivering, he's pale. He's stung by some serious venom. And the Sahaba, one of them said, yes, we have reciters among us. We have people who do ruqya among us. But you guys, for, you guys refused to host us. You were rude and you didn't have to be rude. It wouldn't have hurt you. We're giving us some water, some milk, some dates, some bread. It wouldn't have killed you to allow us to sit in a tent. But you guys were rude to us. So we won't give you a ruqya unless you pay us. Bottom line, nothing is for free. Let alone how you treated us. You went to ruqya, you got to pay. So they said, no problem. So the Sahaba, they went, they recited over the Sayyid. They recited over the tribal leader. For calm, for, 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 he says, and then he was immediately cured. And he just stood, popped right up. Immediately cured. And then they gave the Sahaba a great amount of animals, golden sheep. 
So the Sahaba, they wanted to take the goat and sheep, and one of them said, no, we won't do anything until we return to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he got back to the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi and they told him what happened, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ أَنَّهَا رُكْيَةً He says, and how did you know? What caused you to know that Surah Al-Fatiha is a ruqya? It's a cure, it's powerful, it's impactful. How did you know this? And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahaba, إِدْرِبُوا لِي مَعَكُمْ سَهْمَا it says, don't forget my portion of the, of the spoils. Give me some, meaning that it's totally halal. You did a good job, it's permissible, it's nothing wrong with what you did, the fatiha is powerful, and give me my share. So the halal point from the hadith is that Surah Al-Fatiha has a what? A virtue. It's an excellent thing. Also, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب There is no prayer. For he who does not recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And in another hadith it states that whoever does not recite Surah Al-Fatiha, فَصَلَاتُهُ خِدَاجٌ غَيْرُ تَمَامٍ فَأَوْثَلَاثًا أَوْ كَمَا قَالِ He says the prayer is incomplete without Surah Al-Fatiha. And another authentic hadith, the, the Messenger of Allah he narrates from Allah that Allah says, قَصَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نِصْفَيْنِي وَلِعَبْدِ مَا سَأَلَ I, Allah speaks, I have divided the prayer. Listen carefully to the hadith. Qasam tu salata. I have divided the prayer between myself and my servant in two pieces, two halves. And my servant will get anything and everything that he asks me for. فَإِذَا قَالَ الْعَبْدُ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ قَالَ الرَّبُّ عَزَّ وَجَلْ حَمِدَنِي عَبْدِي The first line from Surah Al-Fatiha you recite, Allah says, My servant has praised me. And when the servant says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah says, Athna alayya abdi. My servant has spoken highly of me. Wa qala maliki yawmideen qala majjadani abdi. And when he says, maliki yawmideen, Allah says, my servant has extolled me. And then the servant, what's the next line from Surah Al-Fatiha? Iyaka na'budu, wa iyaka nasta'in. You alone we worship and you alone we seek help. Allah Azza wa He says, "Hada baini wa baina abdi." This is between, right in the middle, between me and my servant. The ibadah, it's mine, and them seeking my help and asking me for things is theirs. And then the servant says, "In dina sirat al mustaqim, sirat al ladina anam taalehim, ghair al maghdubi alehim, wal dalin." Allah says, "This is hada li abdi, wa li abdi masala." O kama qal, He says, "My servant." has asked me for this and he will get it. This is for him exclusively. I don't need guidance. My servant will get what he wants. So the highlighting point from this authentic hadith is that Allah Azza wa Jal in this hadith Qudsi, he called Surah Al-Fatiha what? What name or title did he give it? The prayer. As-Salah. Surah Al-Fatiha is called what? As-Salah. Showing us the virtue and the importance of this surah. And from the things that we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for in Surah Al-Fatiha every single day, every single Salah, Nafil Salah, Witr Salah, the Sunnahs before Dhuhr, the Sunnahs after Jumu'ah, any prayer that you make, you recite in Fatiha, as we just stated, is Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight path. But as you say that, and as you recite that, aren't you Muslim? So what do you ask Allah to guide you to? If you're already guided. Is Islam not the straight path? Do you have doubt, Akhi? So, so how, what sense does that make then? Oh, Allah, guide me to the straight path, but Allah has made you a Muslim already. To continue, to keep you firm. Islam versus Iman. Outward submission versus the actual inner faith and conviction. Anything else? Fulbayu? That you die upon that straight path. Shake. Tell you what's important is it's, it's definitely food for thought. What does it mean that which I say in my salat every single day? You ever think about that? Have you ever read about that? The tafsir on that? If there was anything that you wanted to study and read and see what the ulama say, it definitely would be what? Guide us to the straight path. What's meant by that? And what did the sahaba, what did the salaf salih, what did they say about that ayah? Ah. Have you read the tafsir of that, Sheikh? You read the tafsir of this surah, this one, Fulan said this, he said that. 
But have we not read the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha? What did the Salaf say regarding guide us to the straight path? Something to get on, huh? So as many meanings, all of the answers that the brothers gave are correct in general. In general. And you can summarize it in two basic principles. Tathbeetul mawjood wa ta'seelul ma'doom. Tathbeet al mawjood wa ta'seel al ma'doom. It's to solidify, to bolster, to drill down what you already have. Tathbeet. It's standing up, but I want it to be planted. In which no matter how hard I try to yank it and pull it, it what? Doesn't move, doesn't budge. It's, it's firmly planted. And then, Ta'seelul Ma'doom is asking Allah to give you that which you don't have of extra guidance, extra iman, consistency, dying upon it, level upon level upon level upon level upon level upon level upon level. But at the same time, you want to keep what you want? Like business. People say, oh, you have another branch you opened up. When are you going to open up another spot? When are you going to get a bigger restaurant? Yo, do you know how hard it is maintaining this small restaurant? Do you know how challenging it is to run a small business? Keeping it open seven days a week when it's slow. When I got 20 million customers. Making sure that my food is fresh, everything. That's a lot of work. Let alone opening up what? A bigger place, let alone branches. So the businessman, he's always thinking about protecting his capital. Is this not the case? The businessman never ever wants to what? Lose. Principle number one. I mean, I gain, but we can't lose money. We can't hustle what? It's a qaida. And then at the same time, once he's hustling well, he's, he's, he's doing well, he's flipping it well, he has his eye on what? What's next? Building. Establishing more. Extending. Right? Well, heck of that. So therefore, that's what's meant by God as to the straight path. Allah has already guided you to Islam, alhamdulillah, but she asked Allah to keep you what? Firmly grounded. Never to lose the gift. Many people aren't sitting here as we speak, right? You see Brother Fuleh and this and that, like, what happened to him? Crazy. Whether it's social media or on the streets or whatever, you go to visit somebody and what happened? Dang. Gone. Let alone what type of state they died in. It's gone. How many brothers, huh? Last year, five years ago, Shake, how many? Can't keep kill. Let alone is that you may, inshallah, you remain Muslim, but you may become stagnated. Your hunger and your thirst is gone. You're not striving to be better, to get better. You're, you're complacent with, with average. May Allah help us all. So every day in your salat, you make that dua, you make that supplication. That's what it basically means, those two principles. Now, what does this have to do with what we want to start in the near future bidden the night ta'ala with regards to um, Sheikh Ali, Sheikh Abu Sajid, they said that I, they wanted me to do something on uh, a compilation of hadith, tadween al hadith, tadween al sunnah, how it started, where the books came from, what were the efforts that the Salaf al Salih uh, put forth and exerted in establishing the preservation of the Prophet Sallallahu golden legacy. His statements, his actions, what he allowed the companions to do, how he looked, how he dressed, how he behaved, his moral conduct and character. The hadith and sunnah, how was it preserved? How was it compiled? How was it put together? How, was, how did it evolve? And how did we get Sahih Bukhari and Muwatta Malik and Riyadh Salihin in this book and that book? The Messenger of Allah over 1400 years ago. And we as Muslims to this very day boldly claim that we have direct scientific knowledge, which is totally accurate, of our prophet and messenger. It's a bold claim. So what do we have to back up that bold claim? Do we have anything? Or is it just something that we just say we have faith and blind faith and that's it? And we just follow what our forefathers and ancestors and that's it? Or is it deeper than that? The sciences of hadith. How the hadith of the Prophet were actually conserved. Whether they were written down, whether they were memorized, how did, how did it get translated? Right? Summarized, right? How did the Sahaba, what did they do to keep Islam pure? All of the things that happened. This war, this battle, this civil war, and problems happened. This invasion from non-Muslims, 
These books were burned, these books were stolen, these people were killed and tortured, persecuted, etc. How did the Sunnah of the Prophet remain pure and pristine and preserved to this very day? So be the night Tyler, that's what we want to talk about in the near future. And alhamdulillah, I've, um, I've explained this more than once on the channel. You can find a full series on this. Rather, this was the first series that I did on Hadith Disciple back in the day when it was Hadith Studies. It was Hadith Studies. Full explanation of the compilation of the Sunnah. And we did it in other places and other locations as well. And inshallah, ta'ala, that's what we'll do here. The point that I'm trying to get, or the point that I'm trying to get to, learning one thing from one thing we learn 10,000 things, is that every time you say, Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path, it's connected and linked to something. And that is what Allah Azawajal says in another surah, وَإِن تُطِيعُهُ تَهْتَدُوا Allah says, and if you obey him, you will be guided. If you follow the sunnah, if you read the hadith of the prophet, if you learn about the hadith of the prophet, if you try your best to take that example, you will have what you ask for in the fatiha. هَذَا لِعَبْدِ وَلِعَبْدِ مَا سَعَلَى Allah says, this is for my servant, and my servant will receive what he asked me for. So every time you make that, you say that statement, you're asking Allah, if you want to simplify, Oh Allah, keep me firm upon the sunnah of Muhammad and allow me to grow even firmer upon the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what you're asking Allah for. And the proof for that interpretation is what Allah himself says. And if you obey him, meaning the messenger alayhi wa sallam, you will be guided. So the tadween of the sunnah, the point I'm trying to get to is, many of us, we may follow the letter of the law or some of the letters of the law, but we don't follow the spirit of the law. They may have the technical things, the beard, the sutra, the pants above the ankles, the miswak, your wife wears the club and gloves and this and that and so on and so forth. The mustache is trimmed. The letter of the law. But the spirit of the law, the spirituality that goes behind the sunnah, and that it isn't just a dress code or what hand you eat with or this or that. It's deeper than that. Islam is the sunnah. The sunnah is Islam. You're asking Allah to make you guided to the way of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam in every aspect of guidance, in every aspect of your deen, of your faith, of life, and of death. So when we learn and we study about Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Ahmed and those great scholars of hadith, it's easy to get caught up in the technical, hardcore stuff. But we oftentimes forget the spiritual nature of Imam Ahmed. The reason why he traveled, the reason why he went to jail, the reason why he preferred to get beaten and whipped and tortured was because of what? The heart, the spirit. Is that this is deen. It's not a joke. It's not a game. It's not something for men or for people or for popularity. Imam al-Bukhari, he did all of that for the Muslims based off of what? The spiritual essence. So that's the point that I'm trying to get to is that when you study any course like this, any technical knowledge, never ever think and feel that it's just technical knowledge. And it's easy to get caught up and lost. And many scholars, they spoke on this. The fiqh, which is outward. this, Imam Ahmed kada, Hanbali kada, this one, this fatwa, oh this, this and that. You, you get caught up. And you don't realize that every single detail, everything that you do in your prayer, your wudu, your hijab, is not based off of the other stuff. But it's based off of you worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You asking Allah for guidance with your tongue. And you being truthful and honest with Allah. Wanting the guidance through your physical actions. Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. Oh Allah, keep us firm upon the way of the messenger of Allah that you have already shown us. And allow us to learn more hadiths. And read more. And study more. And practice more. And spread more. And pump and push and propagate more. That's the name of the game. So never ever think, never ever uh, allow yourself to become bewildered, caught up and confused. You forget about why we're here, what we're here for. And there are many people, unfortunately, whether they say it verbally or whether they you know, speak with their actions, they, they cause the people to be removed from the spiritual essence of the way of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. The way of the Salaf al-Salih is a spiritual way. It's not just a technical way, but it's based off of that ta'abud, right? So that's food for thought. Inshallah ta'ala, it's a few, um, 
you guys can look more into that. I wanted to um, speak more on this, especially about Surah to Noor, uh, which is a very, very, very interesting Surah with regards to the Messenger of Allah والسلام, and the people that are around him. We'll suffice ourselves with that here for tonight, inshallah ta'ala. And hopefully in the next class, we'll get started. Bidna night ta'ala, um, Sheikh Naeem, he's, he promised me to bring the projector. Inshallah, he'll bring it in the next class Friday night. After Isha, Muslims keep their promises. And may Allah protect us from being among those who make a promise and what? Don't keep it. Now, khayran, inshallah. Jazakum wa khayran. If somebody wants to add something, Sheikh Abdul Aziz, Abu Sajid, anybody want to add anything, they're more than welcome. And if not, if your brothers have some questions, or if there are any questions from Mulan, then we'll try our best to take them. Jazakum wa khayran. Second shape. Okay, now I have a question Assalamu alaikum. Hayakallah. Uh, please advise me. I am a Muslim woman who has been divorced for over a year, and I have not seen my children in over seven months, and I have not had any assistance from um, my any 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 Muslim wali or wakil in my family, and I've been feeling depressed and I've been feeling sad, and I need some advice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your fear easy. I mean, my first piece of advice for myself and for you uh, is the prophetic supplications with regards to the prevention and the removal of stress, worry, and anxiety. Asking Allah to protect you from the pains of the past and the horrors of the future. Allahumma. Inni a'udhu bika min al hammi wal hazan. Allah protect me from hem, future worries, future insecurities, wal hazan, and things that have already happened, that were meant to happen, that were decreed, that were meant to be, that caused me pain and grief and anguish. That's my first piece of advice. Second piece of advice is, is to know for sure is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind. Allah is al karim He's the most kind, the most generous. And He is the most merciful. And Allah oppresses none of His servants. And the only thing that you have to do is return to your Lord, ask Him of His kindness, be patient, and do what you need to do. And Allah will keep His promise. Because Allah never breaks His promise. And a story that you can read in the Quran is the story of Musa and his mother. His mother was asked to do something that most women couldn't do, couldn't think about doing. Throwing away their children. Take your young newborn son and place him in the second largest river in the world. Send him downstream. Don't worry. Don't fear for the future, nor grieve for the past. Allah says, you'll get two benefits by believing in what I tell you. By accepting my promise, by doing what you need to do, I'll give you two gifts. You will see your son again. And when he comes back to you, he won't come back to you as just a boy, he'll come back to you as a messenger. So Musa, he was separated from his mother. His mother was sad. Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Qasas, the 20th chapter in the Quran. We fastened her heart. We made her heart firm. 
She was sad. She, she had grieved. She was a human being. And she went through that experience. But she believed in Allah's promise. She did what Allah told her to do. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He was real with her because she was real with Allah. Allah's promise is true, but most men know not. So that's my advice, Bidni Night Tyler. And last but not least, anything that you need to do in this Hayat al Dunya, in this world, which is going to allow you to be reunited with your children, your beloved children. Try your best and seek Allah's help in doing what you need to do to fix that situation. And if that happens, and if you do that, then be in the night Allah, this one, that one, nobody, no one, nothing can stop you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and Allah's kindness. That's my sincere advice. May Allah make it easy for you, rectify all of our situations, and guide all of us. Allahumma ameen. Khayr, anything else before we stop here tonight? Fadha, akhi. Allah bless me to visit Mr. Inshallah. So I just got back and um, I was confused because I believe they already have Ashari. Is this the name? Correct name? Ashari? I don't know much. Keep, it, keep going with your question. Okay. No, so, I mean, the question is, like, specifically about the Ashari. Do they oppose the people of the Sunni? And how do they oppose the people of the Sunni? The question. question is regarding Egypt. I've just visited Egypt. And are there people who are called Ash'ari? Do they oppose the people of the Sunnah? So on and so on and so forth. Like any other group or any other denomination or schism or any other uh, madhab, school, theology or practice, the Muslims split into different schools, different groups. As long as they're under the banner of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, then of course there are going to be things that they're doing right and things that are correct from Quran or Sunnah. And of course, there are going to be things which is the opposite. Things were added, things that were foreign and alien, things that were blended and mixed up, that were not original, that weren't organic. And to keep things simple and to keep things brief, of all of the different groups and denominations and schisms, the way or the path of those who call themselves Ash'ari or, or have that title, even though they may not give themselves that title, is one of the closest is one of the closest in comparison to the other groups. Their percentage of things which are off or wrong or low, relatively speaking. However, with regards to many major principles, there lies no doubt they have opposed the way of Ahl al-Hadith, Ahl al-Sunnati wal-Jama'ah, the Salaf al-Salih. And that's a historical fact. It isn't about this one or that one or Sheikh al it's a historical fact. I would advise you to read the biography of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Read about his life, where he came from, how he was raised, what he went through. Read how he developed and how he established himself. And read the different steps of his evolution and how he died. And what he thought and felt was the correct way that was connecting him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And read about the evolution of his school, his early disciples, and then those who came after them to this very day. And then you, inshallah ta'ala, you will see, you'll find out, wait a second. This is clearly not from Quran and Sunnah. They themselves are saying it. They themselves are saying this principle, this ideal, this kada is from this. So, as we say, the proof is in the pudding. It's not about a name calling contest or throwing mud on anybody. But many people, they get it confused. There are those who say, or oh, the Ash'ari way of thinking is the asl, that's the foundation. And then there are those who say, the only problem between the Ash'aris and the Afari creed is Asma wa Sifat. And that's also wrong. There are many things which are core values which are off. And from those core values which are off is the mixing and blending of the ideologies. The mixing and the blending of ideologies, whether it is the Aql, One's mind, one's brain, one's human reasoning taking precedence over the text. The text cannot be understood without the reasoning. The reason is superior, the reason, etc., etc., etc. So the core values, not just is potato, potato. You say that this, this is literal, Allah's attribute, and they say, oh no, it means Allah's reward. No, it's deeper than that. And many people, they confuse, uh, they mix things up. 
So in brief, there are major core values, let alone just eat yet. Specific issues in which the Ash'ari school is not upon the aqidah and the athar of, of Ashab al-Hadith. That's a fact. And there are many other issues and many other principles and many other practices, which they are. And they're better and closer than other groups and other schisms and other denominations. So I would advise you, inshallah ta'ala, along with studying your aqidah, but just read history. And let the history be between you and me, you and them, anybody. And that's the power of history. And that's why many of the people of Hadith, they would say, Whenever the Hadith narrators will lie and fabricate, I met Aisha, I met this companion, I met Fulan, I met Fulan, we would use history and prove you, Aisha died before you were even in Medina. What year did you go to Kufa? When were you in Basra? Such and such. And it's a very interesting story. It was a man once, he was in a Hadith, or he was, he was in a masjid in Iraq. And the man was a min uh, al he was a storyteller. And it's a very known widespread culture of storytellers, they would tell stories to get money. They would come with nice, sweet sounding hadiths for a gold coin or a silver coin. So the man, after the salah, he stood up and he started narrating a hadith to the people. A nice, nice magical story, mashallah, he would get this reward, etc., etc., etc. And from the people that were sitting there in the mash, it was Imam Ahmed and Imam Yahya bin Ma'in, the two Imams of hadith. So the story says, Imam Ahmed, Imam Yahya, they, they nudge each other, like, check this guy out, man. Do you hear this guy narrating these lies, this bogus stuff from the Prophet? I said, I stuck with Allah. So all of a sudden, so as the man was narrating, he mentioned from his chain of narration was Imam Ahmed and Yahya ibn Ma'in. They told me this, you know the people would accept it. So they walked, he walked out the masjid and he passed by the two Imams. So one of them said to him like, hey you, have some shame, fear Allah. He's like, who are you, mind your business. He says, I'm Ahmed and this is Ibn Ma'in. So the lie, he says, you're the only Ahmed Ibn Ma'in in the dunya? And they walked out the masjid. The moral of the story is, is that facts separate one's claim from another's claim. And it's not just an issue of interpretation or these scholars. No, 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 no. We're going to the core of the problem. And that is to look at the historical evolution of that school of thought. Starting with the Imam, may Allah have mercy upon him, all the way to his later followers. And you yourself will historically see they themselves aren't claiming total orthodoxy to the way of the Salaf. Like Jews and Christians, for example. They don't claim that the Bible is the absolute word of God. Many Muslims, they get it wrong. The Christians themselves don't what? They don't say that. They will acknowledge that the Bible is a mixture. From it is the word of God. From it is the word of this one and this disciple. And they themselves will say it. So oftentimes, we give people things that they don't want. They don't even claim. Right? But you can't discover that unless you go to the, to the, to the core facts. Well, Allah Ta'ala. And hopefully the answer is clear. Inshallah Ta'ala. Wa yakum fadl. Can you accept a shahada for someone for a dowry? Can the shahada be a dowry? Yeah. I mean, are you giving a woman a shahada? The dowry or the mahar should be something tangible. No matter how inexpensive it may be, but it should be something tangible. It should be something which is metaphysical. It should be something you can feel and touch. Whether it be a dollar bill, ten dollars, it should be something that you can actually hold and feel. Unless it's a service. That's a different story. Teaching somebody something for a long period of time, which would they would they would pay money for. But it should be something what? Tangible. Well Allah Ta'ala. Yeah, Allah will take maybe one or two questions from the oh, live stream. Assalamu alaikum, your feed froze. Jazakallah khairan. Feed froze indeed. H.A. from Philly, P.A. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti. Is weed included in the hadith of a Muslim's prayer not counting after consuming intoxicants for 40 days? It's possible. 
However, khamar, whenever the word is used, then the default meaning of khamar is actual wine, not other intoxicants. Even though those other intoxicants can be included, they intoxicate you, but wine in itself has special properties that aren't shared with other intoxicants. And from that is the universal nature of khamar. That everybody, everywhere, every culture, they drink wine. But every culture doesn't smoke marijuana. Every culture doesn't do this type of hashish. That's, that's not accepted. But hey, wherever you go, there's some type of wine. Rice wine, corn, potato, grapes. There's some type of wine. Wherever you go, there's some type of fermented drink. So wine, khamar, is something which is special. And there are some rulings which are specific to wine. And there were things that people had that caused intoxication in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet said, khamar. So weed, smoking it, eating it, chewing it, whatever, it being unlawful, not a discussion. Not a discussion. With exceptions to some issues of medicinal marijuana. With some issues, we said. Some. But the general concept of you just smoking weed, getting high, there's no doubt that that's haram. But is it the exact same? Does it take all of the ruins of khamar? That's something that I cannot say. So it's possible. And if you want to gamble with your salah for 40 days, then spark the Philly, right? Light up a blunt. Go ahead. If you want to what? If you want to gamble with your prayer. Is it included in that or not? Maybe it is. Tafaba, go ahead. A person may say, no, me smoking this blunt is not the same as drinking khamar. Go ahead. That's your risk that you're playing with your salah for 40 days, your soul. What's important is, is that it's, it's possible, and it's also possible for that hadith to be specifically pertaining to alcohol. Let alone, if you just look at the nature of the drug, what happens when people smoke weed versus people get drunk? It's different. It's very different. The nature of, of wine is different. How it causes you to behave and act is not the nature of weed and many other drugs. Wine is, has specific properties, as I said, that cause a specific type of behavior. It's different from some aspects, and same from others. Wallahu alam. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question come from Toronto, Ontario. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufti, what's your thoughts on kings and queens in Islam and in the modern times today? This will be our last question tonight. What's important is, is that there are many terms that are used for Islamic leaders. Imam could be used. Khalifa. Dhillullahi fil ard. Allah's shadow on earth. Wali. Wali. There are many different words and terms that are used. Qaldi, Hakim. Right? So sometimes it's not an issue with the word or the term. King. Khalifa, Sultan, Hakim, interchangeable, synonymous. And then there are other times in which the words mean certain things. And they denote certain meanings. If those meanings are Islamically compliant, no problem. But if those terms go against the teachings and the values of Islam, then it's a problem. What does it mean to be a king or to be a queen? What are, what are the steps for... Uh, uh, Ascendancy to the throne. What are the steps of succession? How does a person become a ruler of the Muslims? So sometimes it's the same and sometimes it's very, very, very different. The power of the king, the power of the queen. So it depends on the content and not necessarily on the actual what? The word and the name and the title. All right? It could be a just king and it could be an oppressive khalifa. Very possible, right? How does a person become the king and the queen? How does a person become the khalifa? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look through all the Islamic history, you'll find these different words and terms being used. There were people who had the most power in Ummah and they never called themselves a khalifa or caliphate. Then when this happened, this war happened, then they became a caliphate. When it fell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it depends. What's important is, is that if a person is an Islamic ruler, that's clear, and if a person is a secular ruler, then that's what? That's clear. Whatever the name or title that you give to yourself, the content. How are you ruling and running your country or your empire, your countries? 
according to the Sharia or according to man-made laws. Regardless of the flaws and the mistakes, but we are acknowledging and recognizing ourselves as an Islamic country. And our, our, our politics are fundamentally based off of the teachings of Islam and the Sharia of Islam versus this is a republic, this kingdom, such and such, such and such, in which they're clearly saying that's not our, huh? the foundation of our constitution. So it depends. That's in brief. It's a very long discussion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuhu wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina wa hamadu jazakum wa khairan.